My name is Philip Bloom. I'm the curator of the Chinese Garden at the Huntington. And I'm here today to talk a little bit about Penjing, which you heard a little bit about earlier um, from Ted Matson, our curator of the Bonsai Collection. I'll be joined and just, well, I'm already joined and will be joined further um, by my colleague, uh, Mr. Chi Zhao Shan, who's a specialist gardener in the Chinese Garden who's accompanied by John Wong, um, a bonsai and penjing practitioner who also runs Bonsai LA. So my presentation will have two parts. I'll do a tour of the Huntington's um, penjing courts first, and then Mr. Chu and John will join me to answer questions about some of the technical aspects of penjing. And then after that discussion, I'll continue uh, with an introduction to the history of penjing and also some thoughts about the at least historical differences between Penjing and Bonsai. So let's get started. Um, many of you probably know that the Huntington just opened an expansion of its Chinese garden um, that in includes a large court for the display of Penjing, um, which is a horticultural art form somewhat similar to the Japanese art of Bonsai. You probably know Many of you probably know that the word penjing is a Chinese term. It literally means potted scene or scene in a pot. Um, similarly, the Japanese term bonsai literally means a potted planting. Um, and these two terms are used in, in both Chinese and Japanese. There's penjing in Chinese and panzai is the, the potted planting in Chinese. Similarly, in, in Japanese, there's bonsai, which we heard about from Ted earlier. But there's also a tradition of uh, bonke or saike, um, both of which are kind of potted uh, scenes. Um, these, I'll be talking more about the history of these terms later, but uh, they've not really been constant throughout history and their contemporary meanings aren't exactly the same as how we used these terms in the past. Today, um, typically penjing are understood to incorporate three kind of related um, plantings. There are so-called tree penjing, which are you know, very similar uh, to bonsai. They, they focus on a single tree. There are mountains and waters penjing, which consist primarily of rocks arrayed in a tray, often displayed with some water and sometimes a very few plants. And then there are also water and land penjing um, that are a kind of combination of the other two forms. They typically consist of small groups of rocks and some forest-like plantings of trees arrayed into a kind of landscape scene. Um, Penjing uh, probably originated in China around 2000 years ago. There are some murals that appear in tombs that show potted plants and actually potted rocks as well. But it's by around the year 700 that we have the first at least pictorial evidence for something that really resembles modern day penjing um, with rocks and plants together creating a potted scene. Um, this is a quite famous mural from a tomb that's dated to 706, in which there's a procession of servants, each of or many of whom are carrying these potted scenes. Um, the somewhat unfortunately, we don't actually know what these potted scenes were called in 706, um, let alone in 100 or 200 CE. So that makes researching the history of these art forms a little bit difficult. But we do know that by the 12th century, so the 1100s, um, the term penjing was actually being used and it became quite a commonly used term a few hundred years later. Actually, throughout the pre-modern period, so basically up to 1911, a number of different words were used to refer to what we now call penjing. Um, they use the terms scenes in pots, potted scenes, potted trees, potted flowers, pl potted plantings, and potted playthings. And not only were there many different terms for what we now call penjing, um, the term penjing itself, as it was used in the past, could refer to a variety of different kinds of scenes. So simply a potted orchid could sometimes be called a penjing. Similarly, an arrangement of flowers, of cut flowers could also be called a penjing. And 
in, at least in the pre-modern conception, all of these different art forms shared a kind of interest in miniaturizing nature, making it kind of possessable or experienceable, um, and creating a scene from it that could be experienced when nature itself was less accessible, less accessible. And perhaps not surprisingly, punjing and also bonsai um, become especially popular at times when there's intensified urbanization and also a, a greater market um, for experiences of nature in the city. But my goals today really aren't just to give you a survey of the history of this art. Um, what I'd like to do first is introduce the Huntington's punjing courts. Um, as I said afterwards, uh, Mr. Cho and John Wong will join me for a discussion so that we can take questions from you about how punjing are actually created. And then um, after our discussion, I'll talk about uh, the relation of our punjing courts to the history of this art form. And in a sense, the, the ultimate goal of that discussion is to complicate a question that came up many times in the earlier um, panel this morning about what the difference is between punjing and bonsai. Um, just one caveat, I'm not a practitioner of punjing or bonsai, I'm trained as a historian, and so I probably look at these art forms a bit more abstractly than Ted might or than Mr. Cho might. And so it's for that reason, um, since Mr. Cho is actually responsible for taking care of all of the trees in our collection, and he's also the designer of many of those trees, um, I thought it would be very helpful to have him here so that he could give us insights into technique. And similarly, John Wong, um, who practices both punjing and bonsai and runs Bonsai LA, uh, will be able to provide a lot of insights that I would never be able to. So I'm, I'm very glad we'll be able to have a discussion with them um, shortly. So at any time during the talk, um, please feel free to submit your questions to the Q&A box that should appear at the bottom of your screen or the top, depending on what device you're using. So we'll take a brief tour of the Huntington's Punjing Courts. Um, many of you probably are familiar with the Chinese garden. It's oriented kind of north to south around a large lake. Here we're standing at the south end of the lake looking north. Um, and if we turn around uh, and look toward the southwest, you there's now a large pav uh, pavilion on top of a hill that overlooks the entirety of the garden. And the Penjing courts are nestled uh, onto the hillside just to the right of um, this pavilion. This is a map of the garden where you can see the Penjing courts uh, highlighted. So when you walk up the hill from the lake to the Penjing courts, you first see a scene like this. Um, there's a kind of architectural compound immediately in front of you. And then off to the left um, or to the south, there's an array of kind of random white walls. Um, and the reason that there are two parts to this punjing display area is so that uh, we're able to display punjing both in a more traditional way, kind of in the way that they might've been seen in the 16th or 17th centuries, but we can also display them in a somewhat more contemporary way as really living artworks against these white walls. The architectural compound is called the world in a wine pot. It's named after a very old story about a Taoist immortal who disappears into his wine pot every evening at the end of the day. And on a particular occasion, he's observed disappearing in the evening and an official confronts him. And so the immortal invites the official to come into the wine pot with him. And they miniaturize themselves and go inside of this gourd and they find and the official finds that there's an entire world contained in, in the tiny little space of a gourd. And so that for us is kind of a metaphor for what punjing is. It's really a miniaturization of an entire world or an entire scene. The central structure in this architectural compound is called the Pavilion of Myriad Scenes. Um, it's actually named after the largest punjing garden in China, which is located on Tiger Hill in Suzhou. Um, our garden as a whole is modeled after Suzhou style gardens and we th thought it was fitting to pay homage to the, the main punjing garden of Suzhou through the name of this building. Um, you can see that there are trees kind of scattered throughout the landscape as well as displayed in the interior of the architecture. And I'll 
show you a few close-ups as we go through. We have about 60 uh, penjing in total in our collection, and we display somewhere between about 25 and 30 of them um, at any one time. You'll notice um, as we go through, there are quite a lot of Chinese elms. That's one of Mr. Shou's specialties. And many of these trees um, were acquired through a very generous gift by uh, June and Simon Lee early, uh, in late 2020. This is um, an example of a South American tree, the star cherry or pitanga. Um, it's quite a beautiful double trunked example. Um, it has really beautiful leaves in the fall. And I, one of the things I particularly love about this tree is the way that I hope, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor or not, but hopefully you can. Uh, with the subsidiary trunk, you can see at the top, it completely bends back upon itself. And so you might ask Mr. Cho later how he achieves um, those kind of effects. Walking into the, the architectural compound, you're greeted by this courtyard. It's called the Forest Fragrance Court. So along with the actual miniature penjing, we also create some kind of life-sized scenes using larger um, trained pine trees as well as larger rock specimens. Um, but these in turn are as, of course complemented with miniature trees as well. This is another view of that same interior courtyard. Again, um, here's quite a, a spectacular elm. Um, it's about 28 years old. It was cultivated by Mr. Cho. And I think one of the things you might notice um, are, are the really perfect proportions of the branches. As you go up the trunk of the tree, every branch is correlated proportionally to its spot on the tree and to its place um, kind of within the height of the trunk. And Mr. Um, as I mentioned, Mr. Cho ma maintained and designed all of these trees and he really specializes in elm, but he also works on some olives, some pine trees, uh, some juniper, also Taiwanese ficus. And he's, he considers himself part of um, a particular school called the Lingnan School. Uh, Ted mentioned earlier that there are kind of regional styles of Penjing, and one of them is called the Lingnan School. It's based in Southern China near the city of Guangzhou. And um, one of the things that really distinguishes the Lingnan School from other regional traditions is its use of the clip and grow technique. So rather than wiring the elm, an elm tree or a pine tree or any other tree into a particular shape, yeah. um, Mr. Cho will actually allow branches to grow very, very long at times until they reach the diameter that he prefers. And once they reach the proper diameter, he'll clip them sometimes to a very, very short length and then let them grow in another direction until they reach a proper diameter and then clip them. So he's able to achieve a sensation of motion in the branches um, through this clipping and growing rather than through the use of wire. Another thing he does is begin a lot of the trees in the ground. So he'll actually let the tr tree develop quite a thick root in the ground for about a year. And then he excavates it. And what was once the main root actually becomes part of the trunk of the tree. Um, and on some of the trees, you can see that there's a very, there's a difference in texture between what was once the underground root and what had um, become the, the subsequent trunk. Um, and you can't see it very clearly here, but uh, many people asked earlier about the kinds of soil or potting medium that are used for bonsai or punjing. Mr. Cho actually often just uses um, potting soil. Uh, he sometimes will use gravelly mixes or things like that, but he uses a lot of plain old potting soil. And um, he can talk about that a little bit more later. So th this is quite a classic example of a Lingnan school elm. It's a kind of tall tree type. It really feel, it's meant to feel as though you've taken a many hundred year old elm tree and miniaturized it into you know, a little pot. Um, this is another view of the interior courtyard where you can see some more eccentric kind of Lingnan school trees. Um, this is a tree that was given to the Huntington about seven years ago and that Mr. Cho retrained into this quite um, fantastic uh, eccentric form. 
And similarly, this is an elm tree that he's transformed into a, a, a re remarkable kind of study in linearity. Um, it's actually modeled after a particular Lingnan school master's trees. Um, there was a monk who was active in the early 20th century who popularized these very austere, almost ascetic uh, penjing. And the monk was in fact active in Guangzhou in Southern China uh, where the Lingnan school is based. Moving to the north end of the courtyard, um, we have one small uh, stone tray planting on display. Um, you can see that this is a very porous stone that's been planted with tiny little elm trees and paired with uh, a, a basin um, that's kept filled with water. So the interior of these porous stones is filled with potting soil or another growing medium, and then the trees are planted therein. The rocks, of course, restrict the growth of the roots, and um, Mr. Cho is able to shape th these trees and to, to, to make them appear as though they're really clinging for dear life um, to the edge of cliffs. The tree itself is displayed on a stone stand that was made by a, an artist uh, named Yoshikawa Wright, who's a stonemason um, here in Los Angeles. And he, he based the stand on a pre-modern Chinese painting. Um, it's actually a depiction of a kind of outdoor scholar's studio um, from the probably 12th century. And you can see that the scholar is enjoying tea or wine outdoors, and he's placed a flower arrangement on top of a very eccentric stone stand. And so one of our goals in creating the Chinese garden is to evoke some of these historical display practices, which uh, Yoshikawa Wright was able to do by creating that stone stand. So looking from the architectural compound toward the array of white walls, um, you can see that we've pl placed some trees within the landscape, uh, and we've also placed a number of trees against the walls themselves. Um, the, the walls are actually not as random as they appear. They're basically, um, there are five walls, and they kind of constitute a deconstructed pavilion, as though you took the roof off of the top of a house so that you could allow sunlight in and could actually cultivate penjing. Um, you enter the, this part of the courts through a doorway that has a calligraphic inscription over the top. And the calligraphy says, seeing the large in the small. So it's a, it's a kind of evocation of one of the fundamental conceptual or design principles of punjing. Um, the calligraphy is by Grace Chu, uh, an artist also here in Los Angeles. Oh, I should say, um, this, these walls are called the Cloudy Forest Court, and they're actually named after an early manual about, for, about stone appreciation. So as you've been able to see so far, stones are actually an integral part of punjing. They're often paired with the tree to create um, the effect of a scene. And so we named this courtyard partially after a manual of stone appreciation, but also after an artist, um, Nizan, who sometimes called himself Cloudy Forest. He used that as his pseudonym. And Nizan's paintings actually became a common model for punjing design in the 16th and 17th centuries. So the interior of this courtyard contains a massive rock. It's probably the most spectacular rock in the garden. Um, it's called embroidered cloud. And we called it that because it include it has quite a lot of mineral inclusions in the matrix of the rock. And so when you get up close to it, it looks as though the whole thing has been woven or embroidered together. Um, the rock is paired with quite a dynamic display of punjing. Um, this is a, a black pine um, that has a little bit of the kind of triangular or pyramidal foliage that you might associate with bonsai, but there are certain features that are more distinctly punjing. Um, so for example, you might notice that this lower branch has been allowed to completely bend back upon itself. And that's a feature that you, I don't think you see very frequently in bonsai, but some punjing artists are very happy to encourage. Um, similarly, this is a Chinese juniper um, 
also cultivated by Mr. Cho, in which you can see a kind of general triangular or pyramidal form to the foliage. But compared to many of the trees that um, Ted showed us earlier, there's a bit more of a sense of wildness to this. Um, one way that people often distinguish punjing and bonsai is by drawing attention to the kind of um, formal perfection of bonsai versus the wildness or naturalness of punjing. Uh, that's, that's a possible way of distinguishing them. I don't think it works in all cases. There are lots of examples of very wild looking bonsai. And similarly, there are some very perfect looking punjing. Um, it, sometimes these distinctions, as I'll discuss later, are really just come down to the personal choices of the artists. Um, throughout this area of the garden, we've again used some kind of nice rock display stands um, created by Yoshikawa Wright. Again, this display stand was modeled after a painting. Um, it's actually a 12th century painting where you have a group of monks conversing about some text and they've placed an incense burner on a rock stand that became the model for a couple of stands in our garden. This, um, again, <laughs> quite a beautiful rock display stand, but supporting a cascading juniper. And um, if you're familiar with bonsai design, you're probably aware of formal styles and informal styles, upright trunks, slanting trunks, cascades, semi-cascades, all of these different terms for distinguishing the form of bonsai. And actually many of those terms are used in Chinese as well to refer to the forms of different trees. I'm not sure at what point that vocabulary came to be shared and at what point it became codified, but at least in the late 20th century, there's quite a lot of shared terminology now between um, punjing and bonsai. As I mentioned earlier, Mr. Cho works a bit with olives. Um, this is quite a nice double trunked example and it's displayed in such a way that throughout the day it creates total, a totally different impression for the viewer. So um, we erected these white walls in order to allow visitors to view the trees in at least three different ways. So you can always appreciate the punjing as a living sculptural form. You can also imagine the walls as a white piece of paper or silk and the punjing um, as a kind of painted a color painting on that white um, paper or silk. But throughout the day, the shadows of the trees change. And so it also becomes possible just to appreciate the shadows as though they're living ink paintings um, rendered directly onto the walls. There are lots of very interesting plays of light and reflections throughout the courts. Um, if you come very early in the morning, you're treated to views like this. If you come later in the day, um, of course, the shadows are reversed. And in the, the full sunlight too, um, there are some quite beautiful plays of light. So I'll just end the tour with this um, final scene. It's the last wall in the Penjing court. Um, you'll see that there's a kind of interestingly shaped doorway that is meant to resemble something like a wine pot or a medicine pot. Um, it's based on a 17th or 19th century design. There are also three carved tiles that I'll talk about later. But I think the star is really this um, Taiwanese ficus that I think has incredible character. It always kind of reminds me of like a sort of a Shrek-like character or, or a tree whose COVID hair needs a little bit of trimming. Um, so I will uh, ask John and um, Mr. Cho to join me and we'll take questions from the audience. Um, and I will, Mr. Cho primarily speaks Chinese, so I will um, try to translate questions into Chinese for him and John will be helping me um, translate Mr. Cho's answers back into English. So let's see. Okay, um, so Chu Shen Shen, you can hear me? Yes. Okay, good. First of all, you have been working in the past 28 years, 30 years, 40 years, right? Yes. Now, you 
子。你有没有就是在这个修养的过程中有没有拍照？你你有没有记录下来他是怎么嗯、um, 发展的？ Uh, I'm sorry, I should have said that in English first. Um, the first question is whether there are any pictures of the trees as they grew over the course of the um, 28 or 30 years that Mr. Che has been working on them. So, um, Boaz, in central. Uh, some have pictures and some don't. Right. He doesn't have any. Any history of the of this uh, ficus? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, the elms he has a lot. Um, could he just? I'll ask. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about how the? For, let me try to put up um, an elm again. I don't buy the elm. So can you see that? Yeah, how that. That, um, can you tell us a little bit about how this tree has changed over time? Uh, it, he planted it as a stick. Yeah. Once, once they um, had the small branches, um, once those set and he picked them, then he let them grow and grow and develop. So uh, he's explaining that the way that uh, the trunks, the trunk line is developed is that uh, um, you, you, when you cut the trunk line and you have, you're left with uh, another sprout, um, you let that sprout get to about 60% of the size of the width of the original trunk. And then that's when the thickness is uh, acceptable. And so it's, so you, then you cut it again and then so on, another 60%, another 60%. So it's, a, it, it's, it's talking about developing movement and taper. There's a question about what's the difference between Lingnan Panjing and other kinds of Panjing. Um, could Mr. Che give us his take on that? There's five big uh, styles or groups of styles in China. Yeah. Uh, so they are, so because there's more deciduous or uh, broadleaf trees, uh, narrow leaf trees. Uh, in uh, in southern China, they practice more and they appreciate more of uh, that those species of trees. Alright, so so the taste of Lingnan uh, style is uh, is slightly different. And it's different because of the proportions of uh, uh, the development of the trunk and branches. Oh, so he is talking about taper and clip and grow in, in terms of development. So, so in, in our Lingnan, Lingnan style, we're trying to, uh, we're trying to make it natural and make it look as if nature created it. Yeah, 
Chan says his uh, trees in <clears throat> in the Huntington Gardens are uh, are slightly younger, so uh, they need more time to develop. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, so in a couple of Che's trees, he has these branches that totally bend back upon themselves. How, how do you achieve that, achieve that effect? So, like, so uh, Che is saying that it's all cut uh, in terms of um, cut. Yeah, yeah, like, uh, so uh he's saying that if you want like uh it to reverse on itself this way, then you cut this one completely off. And so it's all clip and grow, and it and it's uh dependent on where the bud develops after you say for example you just cut it flush like this here uh it would depend on where the branch i'm sorry where the bud developed and which direction it went into so if the bud is going back then okay then they take advantage of that direction of that bud does that make sense yeah that's great thank you um so, uh, uh, well, another technical question. Um, do you grow things from cuttings? Do you use seed? Do you do wild gathering? Uh, <coughs> so, Okay, so uh, most his elms, he says he starts from root cuttings. Uh, I guess they wouldn't be root cuttings, but they would be roots. And then uh, the larger trunks that he uh, starts off with are uh, collected from, uh, say, if somebody's building a house or clearing a lot, and they tell him about it, then he'll go look and uh, see if he can find some some stock like that. Great. Um, and then, how do you decide on the pot that you're going to use for a particular tree? So, okay, so uh, after he uh, uh, digs it out of the ground, because that's where he develops uh, a good portion of the tree, um, then he decides based on the shape of the tree. <laughs> it's very general, the answer. Uh, <laughs> Okay, there's going to be some lost in translation stuff here, but uh, he says like uh, the technique that he uses um, is uh, first uh, in-ground development, uh, and it, he's uh, advising uh, all the all the hobbyists out there that if you actually try to develop it in a pot. Uh, it will uh, take a very, very long time or never get there. Um, then after, uh, after the tree is finished developing in the ground, um, because that's where most of the development takes place, uh, once it's uh, dug up, then that's when you decide what pot to put in. Uh, yeah. I think that's the gist of what he said. That sounds about right. Yeah. Um, so I think maybe we'll have two more questions for both of you. Um, first, what trees would you recommend? What trees would both of you recommend that beginners start with? Uh, 
他们应该用一种书，书法。我们说基本功，这也是对你艺术有益的。So, uh, the Lingnan Lingnan School answer is, uh, to practice your basic fundamental techniques, you should use elms. Okay, <laughs> that's what Ted said too earlier, actually. <laughs> what's, John, what's the John Wong answer? Uh, he said, uh, uh, Master Chess said other trees are okay too. <laughs> Wood tree. Wood tree. Yeah, oh. uh, he says not pines or junipers. Uh, they would, uh, Trees that are easier than pines or junipers. What What do you recommend, John? Me? Yeah. Oh, uh, whatever you like. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you're getting. I, I think you're getting into it for like you know whatever reason you you like. I mean, a lot of people like oaks. They like willows. They like things that like traditionally, like in Asia, they don't use in bonsai. But you know we're in a different country and we have different tastes, right? So um, the techniques, yeah, it's not like uh, depends. Like I think like if you're going to into the elms and you're doing like that school and like following something like very strictly, okay, then you follow it. But if it's uh, it's if it's more opened up, yeah, you might not get like like you know the basics like completely down as quickly, and you might be confused, but you know, that's, it's part of the journey. And then another question for both of you. Uh, how do you, how do, what would you two say is the difference between punching and bonsai? How would you distinguish between them? So uh, Che is saying that uh, uh, Japan style is uh, very similar with uh, the Shanghainese school. Yeah, like they're pretty, they're pretty close. Yeah. They're approximate. They're approximately close. Yeah. <coughs> Yeah, so so uh Chia saying that like uh a lot of China has uh a lot of the practitioners in China are doing Lingnan style uh because of uh the the deciduous trees that they they uh they create are are nice and they're different. Um, of course, there's he, he also mentioned that in northern China, uh, they they uh, play around with uh, some of the conifer trees uh, because of the climate there, uh, and it looks completely different than the Lingnan style. Um, he says there's a lot of uh, of uh, Cross pollinization, where like one country learns from another country, or some practitioners learn from amongst themselves, and so uh, uh, nowadays um, uh, everybody's learning from each other. And how would you answer the same question, John? Um, hmm. Uh, I, I, you know, everybody. I think uh, the difference is not so important. I think the I think if people concentrate on just thinking like that you're trying to have like some feeling of nature, I think that's what everybody's after. I mean, technically what's different um, would be in China, they have more of an emphasis on uh, lines in terms of not just trunk lines, but they're kind of at least uh, at least Ling Nun school, they're kind of obsessed with like lines and branches too. Okay. Um, whereas uh, some of the Japanese bonsai, um, they're into a more, uh, at least fr from the 90s era, 
It's like more mm -hmm. of a manicured look of foliage. So I, I would think like there's obviously tons more differences, but um, like one that like kind of jumps out is say Japan is trying to uh, create like perfect uh, pads and needles. Okay? And then China is going after uh, like eccentric, uh, very artistically interesting movement of branches and trunks. So uh, for me, uh, as a practitioner, I, I, that's that's the main difference that I feel. And there's tons. Yeah, I mean, there's actually books written about it, Philip. I'll sh I'll share one with you. <laughs> okay, great. Well, thank you both very much. I think we'll continue with the discussion of history that actually touches on a lot of the points that you two were just making. Um, and then at the end, maybe we all can take questions again. Um, so the, the kind of history discussion will take 30 or 40 minutes, I think. Um, and then we'll get back to Q&A. So um, let me just pull up my notes for a second. So basically what I'd like to talk about is actually a, a lot of the points that John and Mr. Cho were just making now about this kind of cross-cultural pollination of penjing and bonsai. Um, and I'd like to do that by talking about three tiles that are in the Penjing court. So this is the, the Taiwanese ficus that I like so much. And just above it are three pictorial tiles. And they actually tell a kind of mini history of three moments in the exchange of Penjing and bonsai between China, or among China, Japan, and the United States. Um, You'll notice I've left Korea and Vietnam out of this history, and I'm very sorry to have done that. Uh, but the, the sources about the histories of those two tra uh, traditions of container gardening um, are not particularly accessible, at least to me. It's something I really am looking forward to learning more about in the future. So the right-hand tile uh, on display is actually a kind of 16th or 17th century penjing. Um, the tile itself is based on a, a drawing, uh, an underdrawing by a local artist, um, Pei Fang Liang Wang. And she adapted two uh, Ming Dynasty paintings. So the Ming Dynasty lasted from 1368 to 1644. And specifically, um, she took these, the two depictions that you see here, uh, one by Ch an artist named Chen Hongshou, who was active in the late 16th and early 17th centuries, and another painting by Li Liufang, um, who was active at the same time. Basically, these are punging um, from the very historical moment that our garden as a whole is modeled after. Um, our garden really is inspired by the gardens in Suzhou in the 16th and 17th centuries. You'll notice that both of these paintings depict plants and rocks in basins. Um, and Li Liofang's painting on the left is actually inscribed. Um, he says, in a pot, I have a small canna plant that has a single trunk with nine sprouts that appear and hide among the waters and rocks. It really has unusual charm. Um, I've playfully tried to depict it. Uh, he, what he calls a Kana or Jiao, um, that character can also mean banana, but it's used to refer to kind of broad-leafed banana-like plants. So I'm not exactly sure what plant it is. It could be in the banana family, but I think it's more likely to be in the ginger family, um, of which Kana is one important representative. So I think both of these scenes really can be imagined as scenes, um, particularly with the Liu Fang's painting. You look at it and you can kind of imagine this banana grove um, in Southern China. Chen Hongshou's painting is actually the primary model for our pictorial carving. And you can see that there are three different plants that are depicted. There's pine, there's flowering plum, and there's also bamboo. And it's been set um, with these kind of geometric rocks. So again, the, the intent is to evoke a kind of scene as though we're standing on the top of a mountain cliff in a slightly forest-like setting. It's, I think, clearly recognizable as a punjing in a modern sense. It's 
combination of plants, rocks, and a pot um, that really evokes a particular scene. But what's particularly interesting about this combination of plants is that it also evokes a poetic um, and a, a poetic theme that was commonly used in painting. So many of you probably know that pine, plum, and bamboo are referred to as the three friends of winter. And they're considered to be representatives of the quality of perseverance. Um, pine is evergreen, it lives through the winter without losing any needles. Plum um, is the first plant to bloom each spring and it often blooms when it's snowy outside and everything else is still kind of hiding. And bamboo breaks without, or I mean bends without breaking. Um, it can be completely deluged in snow and yet still it somehow stands upright. So these became kind of um, botanical representatives of the ideal qualities of a gentleman. And there are many poems about these three plants. There are many paintings about them. And by the 16th and 17th centuries, we know from texts as well as paintings that they also were commonly being planted together in Penji. It turns out that the 16th and 17th centuries when this painting was made um, was kind of the beginning of a high point in Penjing history. There, for the first time really in, in Chinese history, there are lots of writings as well as paintings about Penjing um, beginning around 1550. And from the late 16th century onward, Penjing re remained very popular in China. It experienced a kind of second boom in the mid 18th century when several emperors took a real interest in Penjing. And then of course, in the late 20th century, there's been another major boom um, that Mr. Cho was talking about. I think the 16th and 17th popu century popularity of Penjing is actually related quite closely to the development of cities as well as to the development of an urban economy throughout much of Southern China. Um, this is a 16th century painting in which there's a very small detail uh, that shows a flower shop. Um, and there are a number of other paintings from the 17th and 18th centuries that show shops specialized in um, either live flowers or punjing. There also seem to have been itinerant Penjing salesmen. Um, and a, lot, a large part of their popularity seems to have been because um, cities were growing, uh, scholars were increasingly confined to urban areas. And then particularly in the late 17th century after the Manchus took over, when scholar officials refused to, Chinese, ethnically Chinese scholar officials were refusing to serve the new Manchu government, they instead frequently devoted themselves to the maintenance and care of their gardens. And for scholars who were unable to afford a garden or whose garden had been destroyed during the wars between the Ming and um, separating the Ming and Qing dynasty, Penjing became a kind of important um, alternative to garden ownership. It turns out that some commentators from this period actually remark on this popularity. And so one uh, late 17th century writer says that in mountain forests and open plains where the land is vast and the winds are fair, one can plant according to one's whims and naturally produce a fine scene. But in cramped spaces like cities, how could everyone have a garden? Consequently, lofty and elegant people often cultivate small scenes of potted plants in order to avoid, avoid vulgarity. So, in other words, at least some people at the time linked the cultivation of punjing to a kind of cultivation of the self. You could cultivate a punjing to show that you were um, more sophisticated than vulgar people who had no appreciation of plants. Um, in fact, um, throughout the 16th and 17th centuries, we see the production of a number of treatises on punjing. Um, they tend to be single chapters and larger works. They're usually, uh, they usually appear in taste manuals, so guides to good taste, as well as in horticultural manuals. It's actually not until the 20th century that there's a, ever a dedicated book just to the subject of punjing. Um, I think one kind of interesting thing is that throughout these books, they use a variety of different terms to refer to what we now call punjing. They call them potted playthings, or sometimes they just call them potted plants. 
And they also do incorporate things that today we would not call penjing. So flower arrangement, for example, was a way of creating a potted scene, even though um, we wouldn't necessarily call it penjing today. I just would like to point out a few kind of shared features about these texts in the next few minutes. Um, it's important to keep in mind that these were all written by scholars. So they weren't, some of them were written by people who actually cultivated punjing. Some of them were written by people who just had gardeners who cultivated by punjing, uh, cultivated punjing. And they generally were written by people who probably didn't have the same kind of technical knowledge that someone like Mr. Cho does. So one of the things they all insist on is that punjing, as John and Mr. Cho just said, should be natural or in their terms, heavenly. And so one writer says, a punjing that possesses heavenly interest is superior. A punjing in which the heavenly and the human together take part is next. But if there's only the human and not the heavenly, what is there for me to contemplate? And I've paired this with an 18th century imperial painting that shows a plum tree that was ostensibly found in the mountains outside of Sujo. It was transplanted to a Buddhist temple. It was grown in a pot. The emperor liked it so much that he decided to take it home with him to Beijing. And then he had um, an artist depict it and a number, he sort of ordered a number of his followers to write poems about it. But it exemplifies um, the qualities that were valued in plum trees in particular at the time. You can see this kind of ancient bony trunk that looks as though it shouldn't be alive and yet it um, puts out this new shoot with these beautiful blossoms. And so a number of texts talk about pairing um, ancient bones with charming, the charming young faces of the blossoms. Um, these texts also insist on not showing any traces of the maker's hand. So one writer says a punjing should not reveal the maker's hand. Another says, those whose roots are like dragons and snakes and that show no trace of binding and cutting are superior. So someone asked earlier in the Q&A why the roots are exposed and actually ex exposing the roots is one way um, of conveying the sense that the tree is really clinging for dear life to the top of a mountain and also to give a sense of, of its age. Um, the more complex the root development typically, of course, the uh, clearer the sense that it's a very old tree. One of the other things these writers agree upon is that a punching should be modeled after painting. Um, so one, uh, one commentator says, um, gardeners call those punching that they bind into strange shapes, magpie trees, and these are pleasing only to vulgar eyes. Those who possess some understanding sometimes make use of the pictorial conceptions of Sheng Mo. Sheng Mo was a 14th century professional painter. Um, but this is still inferior. Those who possess true understanding imitate Ma Yuan, who was a 13th century imperial painter. Those, kind, those uh, true connoisseurs are satisfied not with capturing anything that's orderly or uniform, but instead they want to grasp a kind of sketchy sense of witheredness and stiffness. And he, the writer says, this is, this is pretty good. Um, but ultimately, he says, I try playfully to inscribe scenes as being by Nizan, who was a 14th century amateur painter who was revered um, by later literati. And he says, ultimately, this is most fitting. So the painting you see on the right is actually a scene by Nizan. And you can see he creates these very austere um, depictions of trees that in some sense almost seem to lack any real interest. Um, but if if you look closely at his paintings, you find that they're filled with incredible texture and filled with very sophisticated play between wet ink and dry, scratchy brush marks. And so even though on first glance, they appear kind of bland or boring, they're actually filled with incredible interest that becomes that you can kind of savor over time. And so consequently, for the scholars who appreciated punjing, this kind of a model became particularly valued. It, somewhat interestingly, uh, these commentators also typically list painters that a punjing artist should try to copy. And they were making these comments actually at the same time that woodblock printing 
uh, and particularly woodblock printed depictions of paintings were being made available to a wider market for the first time. It's starting in about the 1570s that illustrated painting manuals become widely available. And so um, it's possible then that some of these commentators were mentioning artists that punching makers themselves could then go and look up in woodblock printed painting manuals. So I'll show you a couple of examples of these. In this case, I'm just pairing a woodblock print of Nizan on the left with a painting by him on the right. And you can see how the woodblock print artist has tried to translate some of that scratchy, austere quality into his um, print. So these commentators say that um, you should try to copy the works of, specifically the pine trees of an artist named Ma Yuan, who was an imperial painter in the late 12th and early 13th centuries. And they say that his pine trees were always slanted and coiling. And you get a little bit of a sense of that in this print where there's this almost dragon-like rush of energy upward through the tree. Um, this is another example of how people at the time understood a different style in which Ma Yuan painted in which the dynamism is even more apparent um, thanks to the kind of sketchy nature of the brushwork. They also recommend the works of Guo Xi and early, um, excuse me, a late 11th century imperial painter. And they say that when he depicted pine trees, um, it looked as though the pines were bearing their heads and grasping or opening their palms. And you get a bit of a sense of that in this print too, where the branches are kind of opening and pushing upwards um, as though they're grasping at the air. They also recommend uh, the works of Liu Songnian, a 13th century imperial painter. And they, they describe his pine trees as hanging down layer upon layer. So they're probably describing something like what we would today call a cascading um, composition in Panjing or bonsai. In this print, you're actually seeing a pine tree that's covered in snow and the needles have been weighted down slightly so it appears as though they're hanging down in layers rather than pushing upwards like some of the other pine needles we saw a moment ago. And finally, many of the writers recommend the works of Sheng Mo, um, a professional painter, and they say that his pine trees seemed to pull and soar upward and when his works are rendered in, in prints, they tend to resemble something like what you see on the right, where you have a kind of nice forest clumping of these very vertical trees that push um, upward. So what's the point of um, creating something heavenly and something that resembles painting? Um, all of these writers are agreed that the point is really to create an object in which the viewer can exercise their imagination. Um, so a, a 17th century poet gives a very succinct, um, very succinct expression to this. He says simply, what need is there to search among empty mountains when a forest forms in a few square inches atop my desk? So why bother going outside when you have a punjing on your desk and can imagine yourself into the mountains? Um, I've paired this quote with, again, an 18th century depiction of an imperial punjing, um, a plum tree, that to me perfectly exemplifies that sense of capturing a bit of like a, a, a wild bit of a plum forest on top of a mountain and condensing it into this um, tiny specimen. A number of the writers also say that um, punjing really should evoke something more poetic in the viewer. And so they write that, for example, that when facing a single trunked tree, one feels as though one is sitting on the summit of a hill or mountain with a lone pine spiraling around. When facing a twin, pun twin trunked punjing, one feels as though one has entered the depths of a pine grove. And they say that that makes you even forget the heat of the sixth month. So if you're looking at a punjing, you can forget how miserable you are in the heat of the height of summer. However, um, Punjing were not universally loved by scholars. Uh, there's a writer named Zheng Liang who notes that 
he was actually chided for his love of punging. He says, he, I layer stones and plant flowers in a small pot, but people nearby laugh and point saying, how childish. But then he says, actually, you know, th these people have no understanding of how great punging are. Do they know that the spirit of these jumbled jagged rocks differs not from Mounts Hung and Hung, Mounts Hua and Song? Um, the mountains that he mentions are four of the five most famous mountains in China. And so basically he's saying that in his little potted Penjing, he's able to evoke the essence of the most famous sites in China. And he's able to take a kind of imaginative dream journey to those mountains just by contemplating his Penjing. And the people who chide him for his love of miniatures, which they characterize as being childish, have no understanding really of this practice of dream journeying. There are also some writers though who note um, that punjing is a way of kind of confining the essence of the tree and they actually object to that um, as though they, they really object to confining anything. There's one writer named Li Yu who says that he always hated caged birds fish in fish bowls and punging because they can they try to um, limit the essence of the of a living being. Really though, um, a lot of the writers note that punging are, are meant to be a kind of negotiation between humans and the heavens. Zhao Yu is one of the few writers who gives us any real sense of how Penjing were created, at least in his poetry. And he's, he, he writes a very long poem about um, potted trees. And in one part of the poem, he notes that um, he talks about pruning. He talks about using um, palm fibers to bind the tree. So whereas today, Penjing and bonsai practitioners often use wiring, um, in the pre-modern period, it was more common to use uh, rope or twine woven from palm fiber. He also notes that pliers and fetters are applied to the trees. But most interestingly, he says, despite all of this seeming torture, and the term he uses for pliers and fetters, um, he's actually using terms that refer to uh, prison devices, so kangs or things that really are meant to torture someone. But he says that in time, it will actually seem as though the tree was born like this and it will molt like a snake or a cicada, it will shed its shell. After all, one must wait for heaven's mysteries, only then can one accord with transformation. So really the idea is that humans and the heavens are kind of working in tandem to create penjing. Um, they sometimes are speed, humans are sometimes speeding the work of the heavens um, by binding or by pruning, but ultimately it's still a process that requires quite a lot of time. And on the right, you'll see some illustrations of various gardening tools that were used in the 17th centuries, uh, in the 17th century uh, for a variety of, um, both for punging as well as for larger garden plants. There actually are quite a lot of other things to say about 16th and 17th century punging, and I'm happy to talk more in the Q&A, but I think for the moment it's probably most important just to note that um, this first tile in our garden is really meant to evoke the complex cultural context from which punging emerged. Um, the punjing boom emerged in the 16th and 17th centuries. It's really a moment where we see a confluence of urbanism, market economy, poetic sentiment, interest in painting, even woodblock printing, combining to allow this um, botanical art form to take off. Our middle tile points to something totally different. Um, it's a 19th century context that tells us quite a lot about the relationship between punjing and bonsai. The tile itself is modeled after a woodblock print um, from a 19th century Japanese book on a Chinese style tea ceremony. I'll be explaining this in just a little bit more in detail in just a moment, but it's alluding thus to the Qing dynasty in China, as well as to the Meiji period in Japan. The illustration is uh, truly a bonsai and a, or a penjing, a container garden, and a flower arrangement that were displayed in 1876 at this 
Chinese style tea ceremony that took place in Osaka, Japan. Um, this particular tea gathering was actually sponsored by a merchant who was involved in the sale of Chinese and Japanese antiquities to the US. And the book itself has prefaces by people in China as well as people in Japan. And um, it, it's really a very transnational book in which punjing and bonsai become kind of blurred. So the ceremony itself was using loose leaf tea, like um, what people in China typically drink today and what is drunk in Japan as sencha uh, today. They weren't using um, the powdered green tea known as matcha that we typically associate with the Japanese tea ceremony. Um, as you can see in this illustration, for this particular practice, people were using Chinese style cups and Chinese style pots. They actually would write poetry in a kind of Sino uh, classical Chinese. Um, they were painting paintings in a manner that was evocative of Chinese landscape painting, but of course adapted in Japan. And so, some of the participants in these events would even dress in Chinese style robes. Rather interestingly, there were also Chinese diplomats and merchants who participated in these gatherings and who contributed um, to the books that recorded them. So bonsai or container gardens were displayed in a variety of different ways in these gatherings. Sometimes they would be displayed in a kind of Chinese way on, on top of a table or on top of a stand like you see here. At other times, um, they were displayed in a more Japanese context using a tokonoma, um, that slightly elevated alcove. Um, in this case, you can see a tokonoma with uh, a potted plant, a, a container garden, as well as Chinese style instruments that are being hung in place of a flower arrangement or a painting, which you typically would expect. And then you'll see that the tea itself is actually be, being served on the floor. Um, in a manner sim more similar to the, the powdered um, matcha tea ceremony. The specific image that we chose to replicate um, is the image on the right. It shows a pine tree with a single pine cone, <clears throat> excuse me. And the text above notes that this pine tree is planted in a pot that was imported from either southern China or northern Vietnam. And it specifically was a celadon, a greenish pot. Um, it's paired with a flower arrangement in an old bronze vessel. And then on the next page to the left, you can see that there's a potted scene uh, of um, a kind of orchid uh, and rocks. And then there's also a potted um, Buddha's hand citron. So, What's interesting to me, at least, about these representations of container gardens is that they match very closely to what we see in Ming and Qing dynasty Chinese painting. So even though these plants were created in late 19th century Japan, um, the kind of pictorial models that they're evoking are very much models from 16th and 17th century China. Bonsai, bonsai itself um, actually found a wider audience thanks to these Chinese style tea ceremonies. Um, bonsai had been practiced in Japan for hundreds of years prior to this, um, but it was particularly practiced by members of the military, imperial, and monastic elites. But in the 19th century, as these Chinese style tea gatherings became more popular, merchants, um, scholars, and members of the kind of non-military, non-monastic, or non-imperial elites began to take an interest in potted plants as well. And nursery, or nurseries, I think, recognized an important new commercial opportunity. And rather than simply presenting themselves as places where you could purchase a variety of potted plants, nurseries actually began to specialize in the production of bonsai. Um, it, as far as I can tell, it's really not until the advent of uh, these Chinese style tea ceremonies that there really are exclusive bonsai nurseries. Um, and I think another thing that's particularly interesting and that you can kind of sense from the lower um, image here, which is again a depiction of the kind of setup for one of these Chinese style tea ceremonies, is that there was a certain amount of um, 
interaction with the West through these ceremonies. Um, that becomes especially clear when we look at the people involved in bonsai at the time, as well as the people involved in Chinese style tea ceremonies. Many of them were diplomats as well as merchants who were actively going to the US and Europe and who were also very actively involved in introducing the West um, to Japanese art. So we know that bonsai have been, had been displayed at world's fairs in the US um, I think since 1876 or so, this is an example of a bonsai in a more formal style that was displayed in 1893 in Chicago. And at that particular World's Fair, there were two Japanese pavilions. One of them replicated um, a very early Buddhist temple, but there was also a pavilion that functioned as a tea room. And so it, it was partially through these world fair, World's Fairs that Westerners, both in the US and in Europe, um, began to be introduced, at least in a live way, to uh, East Asian container gardens. At the same time, though, um, Westerners were also encounter encountering potted plants in China. Um, and there are a number of early photographs, beginning in the late 1860s, of potted what we would call today Penjing um, in Southern China. This is a photograph uh, from the Lingnan area uh, where Mr. Chiz uh, was trained uh, from 1869. And I think what's particularly important to understand is that the earliest accounts, Western accounts of miniature plants um, actually are, are accounts from China. Uh, they, first ones appear in the 16th and 17th centuries. And yet, and by the 19th century, it's primarily through trade with China that Westerners start to learn about the horticultural techniques that were used to, to miniaturize plants. There are a number of accounts in garden magazines in the US and England um, in the early 19th century about how to grow plants like this. They're, they're often presented in a very xenophobic and kind of racist way as though these plants are affronts to God. Um, but nevertheless, they do describe how the plants were created horticulturally. Um, and yet, it's really not until the late, later part of the 19th century through interaction with Japan that this art form becomes vital um, in the US and in Europe. So ultimately, this, this second tile is really meant to allude to this complex interaction between China and Japan and ultimately the United States that led to the popularization of container gardenings or container gardens around the world. And then the final tile is actually one of Mr. Cho's trees. Um, I asked him what his what tree he was proudest of and he sent me the photograph of uh, this juniper. And he said that um, it was his best tree ever, but he had sold it to a collector who killed it almost, who killed it very quickly. And so we decided that his best tree should be commemorated permanently through this pictorial represent representation in the Chinese garden. One of the interesting things about this particular representation though, is that Mr. Cha asked us to include two seals on the, the um, panel. The one in the lower left-hand corner um, is Mr. Cho's name, but the one in the upper right-hand corner says Lingnan Panjing. Um, so Mr. Cho, I think, really wanted to make sure that his tree was understood to be a Lingnan-style tree. And as he mentioned, um, today, or at least in the late 20th century, there, there are five major schools of Panjing that are commonly recognized. Um, Sichuan, Suzhou, Yangzhou, Shanghai, and Lingnan. Um, Sichuan, Suzhou, and Yangzhou all use tying um, techniques to shape their trees typically. Shanghai is a bit better known for its use of wiring. Um, as Mr. Cho mentioned earlier, there's actually quite a lot of interaction between Japan and China through Shanghai. And so beginning in the early 20th century, um, Japanese style bonsai became known in Shanghai. Some Japanese trees were imported there. Shanghai was also occupied, of course, during the war by the Japanese. And um, consequently, bonsai cultivation techniques became known there. And so sometimes Shanghai school bon uh, penjing really do more closely resemble um, Japanese style bonsai. Uh, 
And then the Lingnan School kind of stands apart, but thanks to its um, primary use of the clip and grow techniques that we described earlier. Um, these schools in the 1980s were also kind of associated with particular aesthetic forms. Um, so Sichuan, for example, became known for these very strictly create, uh, structured linear uh, trunk forms. Yangzhou became famous for its so-called cloud plains. Um, Lingnan is famous for its more naturalistic trees. Shanghai as well um, claims to create naturalistic or at least poetically inspired trees. And Suzhou is famous for a, a tree that incorporates six bends in its trunk and at least three different planes of um, foliage on each side of the tree surmounted by a kind of crown. However, um, the, although these are claimed to be traditional historic schools, they're actually totally different from the centers of Penjing as they were understood during the Ming Dynasty. In the Ming Dynasty, five major production regions were identified, Nanjing, Suzhou, Songjiang, Hangzhou, and Fujian province. And by the late Ming and early Qing, actually, um, a suburb of Shanghai called Jading was recognized as the major Penjing production center. Um, and it turns out that the five major schools of Penjing today actually were only formalized in 1981, thanks to a government project. Um, the Chinese central government decided that it would promote um, Penjing after the Cultural Revolution, and it selected five um, cities throughout China in which to build large new Penjing gardens. And those cities, it turns out, are today the five major schools of Penjing. And perhaps not surprisingly, Guangzhou, which is the center of the Lingnan School, was chosen to lead this project. Um, so the, the traits of these different schools were identified in a government publication. And over the next 20 years or so, the aesthetic, the, the schools were kind of formalized into particular aesthetics um, and were promoted as you know, traditional art forms. Um, I, sh I think one of the interesting things to note about the promotion of Penjing in the 1980s is that it actually coincides with the revitalization of several other traditional Chinese arts. Um, so in the mainland, um, Penjing was being promoted in the 80s. Meanwhile, in Taiwan, um, flower arranging starts to take be, become formalized in the late 1980s. And similarly, a Chinese style tea ceremony is kind of created in the late 1980s in Taiwan. And in a sense, um, this is probably a, due to the kind of increased leisure time that people in both countries had, um, the in, an increased amount of disposable income. It's a, it also probably has something to do uh, with competition with Japan, um, at least kind of soft power competition. Uh, Japan, since the late 1960s, had been promoting bonsai internationally. China was going through the Cultural Revolution and had no particular means of responding to that promotion. And so beginning in the 80s, it became possible, I think, for China to respond to the promotion of bonsai aesthetics. Similarly, Japan has schools of flower arranging that have a essentially unbroken tradition of several hundred years. Whereas um, Chinese uh, flower arranging had never really been formalized. And so in the 80s, um, some practitioners began reading historical texts and kind of imagining what a school of Chinese flower arranging might be like. The same is true with tea. Um, today, I think these schools of Penjing actually have much less sway than they once did. Uh, in, internet, in competitions in China, trees are being submitted from all over the country and they're being designed in styles that are not necessarily conforming to those five schools in the ways that they might have 20 or 30 years ago. Um, the trees you see on the screen are all from regions of China other than the five major schools. You have uh, Yunnan, Guizhou, Hunan, um, and uh, Fujian. So ultimately, I think 
this third tile kind of alludes to the late 20th century, early 21st century state of Penjing. It's identified with a specific school. It's styled in a particular way. And it really serves as a commemoration of um, the Lingnan style as it was understood um, in the late 20th century. But of course, this tree was cultivated in California. It's not, um, it's not as though it literally came or physically came from Southern China. So it, it gives a little bit of a sense of the transnational nature of this art form today. So um, ultimately, um, these three tiles kind of map out three moments in the history of Penjing and I think provide some possible ways of thinking about the relationship among Penjing and between Penjing and bonsai and among China, Japan and the US. So really I hope this introduction has given you some sense of what we're trying to achieve with the Penjing court um, with our Chinese garden as a whole and with our Asian gardens more generally. Our gardens really exist to provide insight into the complex ways that people have intersected with plants in East Asia over the past several centuries. Although we have a profound commitment to preserving historical traditions and to bringing the past to life, we're equally committed to ensuring that those traditions remain vibrant and vital in the present. And that necessarily, I think, means embracing change and cultural exchange. So I hope that this is, talk has shown you that, in a sense, it's all but impossible to understand the traditional horticultural arts without considering the cultural exchanges that shaped those traditions in the past and that continue to shape our perceptions of them in the present. In a sense, I hope um, that I've shown that Questions such as what is the difference between Penjing and bonsai or what is the difference between Chinese and Japanese gardens have no easy definitive answer. We can really just sketch kind of basic responses that are anchored in specific historical moments and that have full awareness of the complexity of exchanges between different cultures. To put this, I think, a bit more pithily, we might use the words of Ernie Kuo, who once told my colleague David McLaren, um, Ernie Kuo was a Chinese American punjing slash bonsai enthusiast. And he told my colleague David that when my Chinese friends come over to my house, I say, look at my collection of punjing. When my Japanese friends come over to my house, I say, look at my collection of bonsai. So um, with that, I will conclude and we'll be happy to respond to some questions. Hope if we have further questions for Che and John, there's um, here too. And so we can try to respond to them together. So um, please feel free to enter your questions into the Q and A box at any time and I'll pose them. Um, Maybe we'll just first start with a question for Mr. Cho and uh, John. Um, are there particular, are there um, pots that are specifically used for punjing rather than bonsai? Are there any particular differences in the approach to the pots between the two traditions? Cho's answer is that uh, there are no uh, particular differences. You're just matching, you're trying to accentuate the tree. Do you agree, John? Uh, yeah, largely because it's so mixed now. I mean, it's it's like um, like there are people in Japan who have like I know like this one family who like their grandfather imported pots from China for 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 bonsai in Japan, and and so like you know every I guess like his dad spoke Chinese, he had to learn Chinese, and so it's just a lot of like cross cultural mixing, and there. Are, next door neighbor so you know <laughs> yeah it, it makes sense i mean like when i was apprenticing in japan um like uh most of the commercial pots were actually uh chinese pots like not yeah. japanese anymore because you know it's it's just a uh um a result of international trade and who makes you know who makes things more efficiently or um you know market market uh the market dictates, I guess. So, you know, it's 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 mixed and it's complex, but um, but stylistically, uh, I don't see well, uh, in China they'll use a more wider 
uh, wilder pots because some of the designs are more wild. But um, as Chaz is saying, you just you're just matching with the tree. So you know, like if you have a super wild tree, you're using a super wild pot, and that tends to happen more in China than in Japan. So um, there's a question that I'll take about the sidewalks with the rock designs. Um, so you probably noticed throughout the Penjing courts, we have different, we, we call them pe pebble mosaic sidewalks. Um, there are a number of different patterns that are used. They don't actually have a specific relationship either to the architecture or the Penjing. Um, we tried to use different patterns to kind of map out different sections of the garden. So the, the wow. section of walls has one design, the kind of more architectural area has another design. Certain courtyards will have one design, whereas the, pa the pathways that surround those courtyards will have another. Um, actually, all of those designs come from a 19th century uh, garden design manual um, from the, this region of Suzhou. The designs all have specific names, and they've, there's, there's sometimes some kind of um, meanings that accumulate around them. but. It seems like initially the designs were simply attractive uh, motifs. Let's see. Um, Philip, um, yeah, we please. have um, we have an amendment to oh. um, uh, to uh, we think uh, we were discussing amongst ourselves, and we think there's like actually a better uh, example of Lingnan school of a Lingnan school tree. I'm gonna oh. hold it up. I'm gonna see if you can see it. It's in your collection. Can you see that? Oh, I'll bring that one up. I yeah. Can, maybe you can uh, explain why that's the best. Because in Lingnan style, um, there is one particular branch or one branch that's like very dominant and it, kind of like the one on the tile, uh, the last, the third tile, um, that it has one prominent, very prominent branch that extends uh, farther out than all the rest. And because it's Lingnan, that, that particular branch always has uh, interesting movement in it. So there's another question about uh, Panjing and bonsai. Um, do you, do the two of you see now any styles or influences entering into the Japanese or Chinese traditions from outside? So for example, like it, is what's going on in the American Punjing and bonsai community now affecting the way people in China or Japan are styling trees. <laughs> okay, so Chen's answer to that is that uh, that uh, uh, the people who create the trees uh, they are all individuals, um, and uh, it's their own uh, style that influences what they make, and uh, it's not like uh, the trees are like. Uh, a bottle where like a machine like makes like the same one. It's like based on people, uh, uh, doesn't matter who, where they are. And so all the trees will be different. I think that's a great response. Yeah, it depends on the personality of the person. Like uh, it will be reflected in the trees that they make. Great, thank you. Just anecdotally, Thanks to Mr. Cho, I've started following punjing groups on WeChat, which is like the Chinese version of Facebook. And it, it really seems like in the past few years, there's been much more of an emphasis on individual designers, tree, or individual artists' trees, rather than simply following um, regional styles or something like that. Uh, in some sense, I think that's a little bit closer to what's happened in Japan previously. As Ted mentioned this morning, there's never really been schools per se in Japan, but certain nurseries might specialize in a certain style. Or, but there's, there's also very much an emphasis on individual artists, I think. Um, there are a couple of other uh, questions about um, some technical questions. So. Does Mr. Cho or John, do you use root, uh, any sort of growth hormones for root cuttings? 
Jess says, uh, no, he does not use any uh, uh, growth hormones. Um, he says the most important thing is to learn the basic fundamentals on like of uh, how to grow a tree and how to uh, when to cut it and uh, the techniques that are involved with it. Great. Um, let me bring up one other image and ask you about it. So there's another question about how the how you take care of something like this. Um, one of the uh, punging in which the trees are sort of planted into a rock. How do you deal with watering? How do you deal with pruning? How do you deal with repotting? That sort of thing. So, so there's 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 holes and pockets within the rock. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and your 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 tree already has a particular uh, 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 its own shape, so that you're pairing it with the, the rock. Um, the pockets within the rock are actually quite large. Yeah. So so uh, I I guess in essence, and that's not what he said, but I'm just summarizing that it for the for the. The, the, the person asked the question. It's just like taking care of uh, a potted plant, but it's like the pot is in the rock or there's multiple pots in the rock. If that makes but sense, yeah. You, you never repot it, right? Uh, he's saying that you don't repot it when out of the pocket in the rock, it'll probably uh, pass away. <laughs> okay. sometimes sometimes like uh, it's bigger on the inside in the cavity than it is on the opening so it's like almost impossible to get it out without seriously damaging the plant uh but if it does pass away then uh you just replace it with another tree <laughs> 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 or, or if the tree's better than the rock, you just break the rock. <laughs> and do you fertilize them? Honey, don't they have one? Yeah, yeah, occasionally, yes. Uh, just liquid fertilizer or what? Uh, basically, any kind of fertilizer is fine. Yes. Uh, as long as like the particle size is smaller. Oh uh, yeah, if you put too much, uh, you'll burn the roots. Great. Um, and then there's a question about whether there are any opponents to punging like there were in the past. Do you know? I'm sorry, what was that? Opponents? So it, it, yeah, you know, in the, the Ming Dynasty, there were some intellectuals who said that punging was torturing plants. Oh. It was childish and stuff like that. Um, do you know if there's any sort of anti-punging or anti-bonsai discourse today? <laughs> Chess saying it's not torture and it's not harm. It's uh, it's your bringing a piece of nature into your house. Um, I'm not uh, Philip. I'm not aware of any movements like that. Uh, any, I don't know, uh, any carbon footprint issues like that or any movements based on stuff like that? No, I, I'm not aware. That's good. Thanks. <laughs> because so, you're taking, she's saying you're taking care of it. Uh, you're not, you're not abusing it. <laughs> Great. Um, there's one question I'll take, which is, it, it seems that bonsai is more widely known in the West than punjing. So why is that? Um, my answer to that would be that uh, it has a lot to do with, well, actually I have a slide that kind of explains why. Um, let me pull it up. It has a lot to do with the 19th and 20th centuries um, and particularly trade, commerce and diplomacy. So, um, Starting in, in the late 19th century, uh, there was quite a lot of um, interaction 
uh, between Japan and the US. There were a number of immigrants who, who came from Japan to the US and ended up working particularly in agriculture as well as in landscape design. Um, for example, in Southern California, most of the gardening work here was done by Japanese and immigrants and Japanese Americans uh, prior to the 1970s. Um, at the same time, Japan was also exhibiting bonsai at world's fairs. Um, there also were some nurseries that were established. For example, the Yokohama Nursery Company uh, was a major exporter of plants, including punjing, um, to both the east and west coasts of the US during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And there, was, there seems to have been at least some interest in the US in bonsai um, starting in the late 19th century. Then after the Second World War, um, the Japanese government has given a number of very important bonsai to the US. Um, there's a national collection in Washington DC, for example. There are also quite old collections at, for example, at places like the Arnold Arboretum at Harvard University. And more generally, um, since I think the 1960s, there have been international bonsai competitions that have been held in Japan um, in which Westerners have participated for a very long time, but in which Chinese practitioners didn't participate much um, until relatively recently. Uh, and so I think it's all of those factors that have ended up leading to the popularization of bonsai in the US. Um, Penjing here, I think, wasn't as far as I know, there were, wasn't even really a book on punjing in English until the 1970s. And that book was published in Hong Kong. And then in the late 80s or early 90s, um, there was the first kind of introduction to punjing by a Chinese author. So there's just historically um, been much more contact between uh, Japanese bonsai practitioners and uh, the US than with China. Um, let's see. I think we'll take just one final question for John and Mr. Cho. Um, would you, would the two of you say that the bonsai and penjing traditions have merged? Well, let me answer first, then you can, uh, Philip, you can transfer, translate for Mr. Cho. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, no, uh, I, uh, for me, um, no, they have not merged um, uh, for various reasons. Um, uh, it's, in my opinion, though, the, the stylistically, um, the styles will follow the economics. I, I think it's like very economically driven, like which styles are more popular, things like that. It's, it's a matter of like, um, I don't know, uh, just if you know about it. If, it, if you're aware of it. Um, and uh, from a practitioner standpoint, it's, uh, I see like the highs and lows happen. Uh, they're very interrelated to like how much uh, money is sloshing, sloshing around a particular country or region. It's because, um, uh, you know, as a practitioner, we, we get paid to work. And uh, mm -hmm. if we get paid a lot to work, then we do a lot of work. And it's very detailed. But if uh, you know, if there's not enough money sloshing around, then we do less work, obviously. And so, yeah, the the it, the the point of the stick is less blunt. I mean, is more blunt that way. So, um, but Philip, you, you can uh, you can oh, <laughs> you, can, <laughs> you can answer. Uh, you can translate Mr. Chia's answer. I, I couldn't hear. <laughs> So, Mr. Cho pointed out that um, after the Second World War, the Japanese government actually sponsored a number of gardens throughout the world. Um, there are some, there are Japanese friendship gardens all over the world. And as part of the creation of those gardens, they often would send a few bonsai as well. And so that ensured that um, bonsai has become known worldwide. And then I, unfortunately, it seems like his video stopped, but it, I, 
I think he would also note that, um, but he also noted that China didn't really have the opportunity to do the same sort of thing um, just simply because of the political and uh, social changes or turmoil that happened there in the second half of the 20th century. So it's really only been um, in the past, what, 20 or so years that we've even had Chinese gardens outside of China. And so in that respect, uh, Punjing is only kind of beginning to be known worldwide. Um, and as I, I tried to show earlier, that there's always been so much interaction between uh, Punjing and uh, bonsai practitioners that in some ways it does become a bit difficult to disentangle them. Um, so I hope uh, that suffices as an answer. Um, thank you all very, very much for being here today. Um, these presentations, I think, will be made available online afterwards, though I'm not exactly sure how. Um, and please feel free to contact uh, Ted or me with any further questions you might have. Um, we're, we're very happy to talk about bonsai and punjing more. So thank you all for your support of the Huntington, and we'll hope to see you in the gardens again soon.